I hope you're in the mood for some online learning because it's time for HDM School. Hello again, welcome to HDM School. I'm Matt Taylor from Numenta and today will be the first episode on spatial pooling. What is spatial pooling and why does the brain do it? First of all, let's remember that everything I'm going to talk about today is based upon the biology of the neocortex, which is composed of a hierarchy of regions. Each one of these regions gets a bunch of input, millions of nerve axons being fed into it, which come from sensory organs or come from other places within the brain. I like to think about this input space sort of like a fiber optics cable where each fiber in the cable represents one of these nerve axons and whether that neuron is on or off. The cortex has no way of knowing what any of these nerve axons mean or where they're coming from at all. It's one of the big problems that it has to solve. But it has to find a way to normalize that input over time so that it can start learning sequences of patterns in that space. Also, the size of the input space, the number of nerve axons, is variable. So a region could be looking at a small portion of nerve fibers coming into it, or a very large portion. The spatial pooling algorithm has to solve these problems. And it does so by accepting an input vector, like we were saying, the fiber optics cable sort of, and translating it into an output vector of a different size with a sparse number of activated bits. Now, an output vector of the spatial pooler represents many columns. Many columns are a column of pyramidal neurons in the cortex, and they're really important when we start talking about sequence memory and how your brain recognizes temporal patterns of sparse distributed representations over time. But for the purpose of explaining how the spatial pooler works, we don't have to understand many columns at all. So we're going to put off that discussion for another day, and I'm just going to refer to columns in the spatial pooler, and that's the representation we're going to deal with today. So let's talk about two of the biggest goals of spatial pooling, and that's something we're going to visualize today. One is for the spatial pooler to maintain a fixed sparsity. So as it sees input in this input space, no matter how many bits are on in that input space, the spatial pooler needs to maintain a certain sparsity in its output all the time. So it sort of normalizes that while continuing to maintain the semantic meaning, which is number two, the second big goal, and probably the most important one that the spatial pooler has, and that is to maintain the overlap properties of the input data. So in this input space, if you get two different representations over time and they have a high overlap score, meaning they're semantically similar, the output data that the spatial pooler creates to represent those pieces of data also must have a high overlap score. So if you've got two similar inputs, you should get two similar outputs. The other side of that coin is if you have two very dissimilar inputs, the spatial pooler should create two very dissimilar outputs. So we have to maintain those overlap properties of the input space in the output space that we are creating. Now the spatial pooler is a learning algorithm. We'll see this in action in our future episodes about spatial pooling, but this is sort of an introductory episode and I'm gonna talk mostly about the input space itself and how the spatial pooler maps its columns onto that input space. And it's not gonna involve learning at all. We'll talk about learning in the next episode. So let's first explore the spatial pooler's input space. And here is an example of the spatial polar input space. In fact, this is an example that I am uh, likely going to use for the next couple episodes. First of all, uh, this SDR that we see over here, it's not really SDR, it could be a dense representation. Um, it has an input space in, in its current configuration uh, that is astronomically large. There's no way you're gonna run out of values in this input space. It's uh, more values than there are atoms in the known universe. Um, so second of all, uh, each of these data points that we're looking at here uh, gets represented uh, in this input space. So what I'm plotting here is the, this data in this graph up here. 
Uh, the power consumption, and, and this is actually a, a gym, like that you go work out in, um, and the power consumption over time, I'm encoding power consumption, time of day, and let me just be really explicit about this. Here's the power consumption, and that's where we get from this little dot right here, and this is represented here in, in this bucket of bits in a scalar encoder. Uh, the time of day is getting taken from you know, the time. The weekend is also getting taken from the time. You might notice that these are different from the other days because those are weekends. These are also weekends. These are also weekends. Anyway, the time of day is in this bucket of bits and the weekend is the rest of these bits down here. Um, so pay attention to those bits as we move along here. Uh, as the power value goes down, you can see that power bucket jump up and change quite a lot. That's what we want to see. Um, and as I'm progressing through each day, the other set of bits down here that are, are representing a time of day just kind of rotate uh, periodically through the, their encoding space and then reset when the day resets. Now the, the weekend bits down here, you're going to see change as soon as I get to the weekend. So this is Friday night, midnight, and then boom, Saturday morning. Friday night, Saturday morning. So all of this data, power consumption, time of day, and weekend, whether it's weekend or not, is being represented in this input medium. So uh, like I said, when I talked about the, the fiber optics analogy, it, it really, I like to think of this input space as a communications medium. There's so many different messages that could be sent across the space, it's more than there are atoms in the universe. So what the spatial pooler is going to try to do in this input space is extract this space, the spatial uh, uh, correlations in this data as it sees them over time. Um, so that's what we're going to, to look out for. Uh, one interesting thing is, you know, this, this particular data set has a certain data signature when it's encoded in this specific way in this input space. The spatial pooler can handle different data signatures. For example, if I want to use the random distributed scalar encoder instead of just a scalar encoder, I could do that just fine. So it completely changes the representation of data in the input space, but the semantic meaning is still there. So the spatial pooler will still result with the, in the same outcome. It can get the semantic meaning from the bits, whether they're in one continuous bucket or whether they're randomly distributed throughout the space like they are now. So uh, it just also goes to show you how many different possible ways there could be to represent this data in this medium. The, this is not the only way. There could be hundreds of ways, uh, thousands even, to, to represent even just one particular data set in a communications medium in a way that the meaning is encoded semantically and the spatial pooler can pick that up. So now let's investigate how the spatial pooler initializes itself to the input space. Uh, so what we have here is on the left, we have the input space. On the right, we have the spatial pooler's columns. They don't have to be the same number. And what the spatial puller is going to do is take that input space and translate it, translate the, the incoming data in that input space into active columns in its representation in the output space. So the first concept I want to explore here is uh, the idea of a potential pool. Every one of these columns has a different potential pool of input cells that it might be connected to. As I kind of mouse over here, you can see that each one is randomly, potentially connected to a different set of uh, input space bits. And this is a, a parameter that can be tweaked by changing the potential percent in, uh, in the new pick spatial pooler initialization settings. But so that's the number of potential connections that each cell could have. Now, each one of these potential connections, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna click this button to show permanences over here. Each one of those potential connections also has a permanence attached to it. And now I'm showing a heat map of what that permanence is. So bear with me as I click on this one cell and I get a, a representation of the connections as well as the permanences. So let me do that here. Okay, 
So this is just that very first column in the spatial pooler. It has a relationship with every cell in the input space, and that connection or potential connection has a permanence value associated with it. Uh, for, for every potential uh, pool, every potential connection in that pool. So the white cells are the ones it will never connect to. So I, I misspoke, not every single connection, uh, every single cell, but uh, within its potential pool. In this case, 85% of the input space. But all the other cells that are colored have a, a permanence value associated with them. For example, this one right here, this red one that I'm looking at, has a permanence value of 0.1. It is not connected, as you can see here. There is no dot there. That uh, The blue circle means there is a connection from this column to that cell in the input space, but in this case there's not. And it's because the connection threshold of 0.1 was not exceeded. The, o the permanence itself was 0.1, but it was not greater than 0.1, so there's no connection. If we move down here to the input space cell just beneath it, there is a connection to this cell because the permanence value is above the connection threshold. Okay, so 0.54, and that's what this little one bar graph is showing you. As I hover over these cells, you can see that graph changing. Um, none of these have a permanence value that's large enough to be connected, but all of these do have a permanence value that's large enough to be connected because they are all above the connection threshold. So there you can see why every cell has connections when they are above that permanence threshold. So um, I can change this up if I want to just by changing spatial pool of parameters. For example, I'll change the permanence or the potential percent to 0.4. So instead of 85% of the input space, uh, each column being mapped to 85% of the input space. I just changed it, so now it's going to be 40%. So our initial number of connections is going to be much, much lower. Uh, as you'll see as soon as the spatial pooler reinitializes, and I'll hover over these cells here. Um, there it is. So, uh, so a much, uh, it'll probably be clearer if I turn off the permanences. Uh, yeah, so this is the potential pool now for each cell which is much smaller, it's only 40%, it's about half the size as it was before. When I click on it, there's much, many fewer connections as well. Just because the potential pool of connections is smaller, that means the number of connections that you're going to get is smaller. So let me also show you one more parameter I'm gonna change, which is the uh, connection threshold. Um, let's change it to like 0.7, let's say. Here we go. So the connection threshold, let's, I'm gonna turn lines back on and we will click on one of these cells. Um, and let's also show permanences too. Here we go. Uh, so, so, let's turn that off. Now, as you can see on the right over here, our connection threshold is 0.7, because that's the value that I just changed. Any permanence, Below 0.7 will not have a connection, anything above will have a connection. But one thing you might have noticed over here is that the number of connections hasn't really changed much based on the, the last iteration of uh, Spatial Pooler I created uh, before I upped that connection threshold. It was 0.1, now it's 0.7. But it didn't change the number of connections. You would sort of assume if I'm making that threshold higher, I'm going to have less connections. But the spatial pooler will try to sort of give a normal distribution of permanence values around that connection threshold. So you have a lot of connections that are primed to either become connected or become disconnected, uh, but they're sort of grouped in a, in a normal distribution around that connection threshold. Uh, so that's why you see that the, the number of connections doesn't really change much, even though I've changed the connection threshold. So let's take a, a look at this from sort of a, another angle, and I'm going to show the input. Now this is just some random input. Uh, I haven't passed this through the spatial pooler. I just want to show you how the columns in the spatial pooler, uh, based on their initial random connections to the input space, uh, how we would activate those columns based on some input. So first of all, as I hover over this input space, every bit, uh, what I'm displaying on the column section here, 
uh, every bit could uh, has connections to all of these columns, or actually it's these columns have connections to this bit. So you can sort of see in if I'm if I'm interested in this bit for some reason, I can get an idea of what columns are currently mapped to it or currently have connections to it. More interesting, I think, is uh, if we go the other direction and look over here at the columns. So uh, in this case, this column is has all of these connections. Uh, there are 123 connections that this column has out of its potential pool of 252. Um, and each connection, some of them are within this input space, or this encoding, right? Some of them uh, overlap with the actual data that's being encoded here. Some of them don't. So if you're looking at the, the green circles, those are connections that this column has that overlaps this specific input. The gray ones do not. So as we move forward and talk about learning, I'm gonna talk about how columns learn based on the when they see input, whether the their connected synapses get reinforced because they continue to see input on that connection or they get decremented in some way because they do not see ever any input along that connection. So that's going to be important when we talk about learning. Uh, but for right now, uh, an important, the thing I want to highlight here is the overlap. There are 43 connections that this cell has to this input space. Um, that are currently overlapped with this particular encoding. So that is that current that columns overlap score. Um, as we, we scroll through these other columns, you can see uh, this overlap change, this value change over here as we go from one column to the next. Different columns are going to have different overlaps with this particular input uh, at any point in time. So th these different columns will eventually learn to uh, recognize certain spatial features in the input as they, as they learn. But for right now, if I wanted to activate some of these columns based upon this specific input, I might decide where is that overlap threshold? Is it 40, 50, whatever, and say any columns that have an overlap above that threshold with this input space, I'm gonna call active columns, and you're gonna see that in this next visualization that I'm going to show you with a random spatial pooler. So <clears throat> now I'm going to actually push some real data through the spatial pooler. And we call this a random spatial pooler because it's not learning anything. When you push data into the spatial pooler, you tell it whether you want to learn or not, whether you want it to reinforce its permanences based upon this input or not. In this case, I'm not going to learn anything. So the, the spatial pooler we're going to be using is just based upon its random initial state mapped to this input space, and it is not going to learn the spatial correlations in the space over time. But a random spatial pooler still uh, has some of the properties that are, that are useful in HTM. So I'm just going to hit play here, and we're going to talk about what's going on here. So uh, this red line is right now in time, and at each point, the input space, which I've already talked about, the power, time of day, and weekend is being encoded in, in the input space, and the active columns coming out of the spatial pooler are being shown on the output uh, in the active spatial pooler columns grid over here. Now, um, something you can already note is that first property I talked about in spatial pooling, which is um, a fixed sparsity. So we can see that even though the input space may have a different sparsity the, uh, the spatial pooler columns over time will have a fixed sparsity. So we'll get um, a, a normalized sparsity from the spatial pooler and the semantic details of the data will still be encoded in that representation that the spatial pooler is creating. Um, and and uh, let me show you uh, some evidence of that actually occurring. Uh, so one of the things I'm doing here, uh, you see these sort of bouncing balls over time. Uh, so there's the yellow balls and the green balls. Uh, the green balls, and let me just pause this so that I can explain it a little bit better. Okay, so at this point in time, right here, uh, 7 p.m. on a Wednesday, whatever, 
It is not a weekend, 7 p.m., and the power is 43.6. Um, what I've plotted here is uh, on this line, 10% of the previous encodings that we've seen all along this data space, the top 10% that are most similar in overlap scores to this particular encoding that we're seeing right here. So this encoding is most similar to everywhere you see a green dot over here, which makes sense that it's about the same time and about the same power level in previous times, uh, previous days that it has seen. So that's just the encoding of the input space. And we know that it contains semantic value, if you know from our previous lessons about coders, because we encoded it to have semantic value, uh, the power, the time of day, and whether it's a weekend or not. Um, so to compare how the spatial pooler is doing in representing the semantic value in that data, I have also plotted the exact same thing for the active columns in the spatial pooler. So at this point in time, this is the state of the spatial pooler. These are the active columns. This SDR is being compared to every other SDR that it's created over time. And the top 10% most similar in overlap, so the ones with the highest overlap score, are being displayed on, on this chart above. So as we uh, move along here, you should see that as this data is moving forward, those balls should be bouncing sort of up and down with the pattern of the data. And one of the interesting things that you'll see that uh, is a good indication that Spatial Puller is working well is, for example, since we are on a Friday here, all of the most similar representations for both the encoding and the active columns in the Spatial Puller are all on weekdays because we're currently on a weekday and they're mostly in the mornings of the weekdays. And as we continue onward, we're gonna get right here and you're gonna see that uh, we're gonna switch to a weekend. As soon as that happens, uh, the most similar suddenly changes for the most part to uh, these weekends. So we get a lot more dots occurring on the weekends. Now that this data that we're seeing is representing a weekend, we get many, many fewer similar representations from weekdays in the past and more similar representations from the weekends in the past. And you can see it very explicitly here in this, this data point right here. We're seeing nothing, the, the top 10 most similar, or the top 10% most similar encodings and spatial pooler columns in the past are all on weekends, which shows us that even though this looks like just some random scattering of bits in the spatial pooler columns, they're actually representing semantic meaning. And this is even without learning turned on. So if we were to turn on learning, the spatial pooler would be better at recognizing the correlations in the spatial input. So <laughs> I've come to a close of this episode and some of you might be having trouble keeping up at this point. It's getting a little bit deep. Uh, we're getting into the real meat and potatoes of HTM theory here. So if you're confused and, and you have some questions, um, you could go ask them in the YouTube comments, but a better place would be to go to discourse.numenta.org. That's where we have our HTM forums. I'm on there every day. I can help you out with your questions. And don't feel bad about going back and reviewing previous episodes. We talked a lot about sparse distributed representations and encoders in this episode. And if you missed those previous episodes, uh, no wonder you're lost, because there's a lot of good information in those that build up to the concepts of spatial pooling that I'm going over in these episodes. So as always, if you like this, if you're enjoying this and it's informative, please hit that like button and hit the subscribe button so you won't miss the next episodes of HTM School. I really appreciate you watching this. I am Matt Taylor from the Menta. Thanks for watching HTM School, and stay tuned for next episode. We're going to talk about how the spatial pooler learns. Take care.